That's Matthew, the 28th chapter. And I'm going to start with verse number 18. Very familiar passage of scripture that most of y'all have either seen or heard or even read. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Thank you, God. Amen. 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 This morning, uh, this week, I spent a lot of energy trying to decide what should I share as I celebrate this time that God has given me on earth? What kind of message can I share to let God know how much I appreciate him? Let him know how much I love him and how much I care about him and the life that he's given me and those around me. And it took me quite a bit of time to think of what would just be the right message that I could deliver to those that God has entrusted me to love, to care for, to lead, and to just be all that I could be for. And this morning, this lesson and this text and this message sermon is titled, You Are Hired. All right. You are hired. Or you are hired. Depends on how you want to say it. And it made me think about what do we feel when we get that job we so desired? Mm -hmm. Have either one of you all ever wanted a job? And when you got it, do you remember the feeling that you had when the person said, you're hired? Mm -hmm. You stood up, she stood up, shook your hand, and congratulated you by saying, you are hired. Welcome to whatever place of opportunity and business that you were just hired for. Mm -hmm. It made me think about the jobs that I had. And you know, I realized something. In this short time that I've been here on earth, I started working at a very early age. And if I could pinpoint it right, I want to say I was either around seven years old when I first started working. Some of y'all might not consider it a job, but to me, when you're doing something and someone is paying you for it, it's a job. It's work. <laughs> So, the first thing I remember doing as a job was collecting bottles and cans. Mm. Back then, they, used to give, they used to give you money for bottles and cans, so much so that it would be enough to buy some chips, cookies, sodas, or whatever you desired back then, at that age. And I enjoyed making that money. I used to go around and collect cans, collect bottles, and take them to the store. You know, we used to say, we didn't have to go all the way across town. You could just take them to the community store and they would pay you for bottles and cans. Yeah. So I was able to start doing that around seven, eight years old and probably around the age of 11, I got another job. And this job was a little more formal. And what happened, there was a friend of mine named Chuck. He had a paper route and Chuck, he had a paper route, but he didn't like delivering the papers every day. And back then, that's when little kids used to deliver the newspaper. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, now they say the grown people don't took that job. They don't let little kids do stuff like that no more. But y'all remember the newspaper boy back in the day? Yep. When they used to throw the paper and sometimes you used to have to go in the bushes and get it. Or they <laughs> throw it anywhere. You know, we didn't care. We just threw the paper, threw the paper. We just, and, and it was so interesting and how I got that job. I started working with my friend Chuck. And Chuck, he would sometimes not want to work. He was like, damn, I want you to do it and I'll pay you for that day. Uh, we will let you get the money for that day. And he was subcontracting. I didn't even know what subcontracting was back then. <laughs> <laughs> but Chuck was subcontracting me to do the job when he didn't want to do it. Now, we had a lot of houses we had to deliver that newspaper to. And we didn't have a car. We didn't even have a bicycle at the time. We used to have to walk and do it. So what happened one day, I don't know how we came across a grocery store buggy. But anyway, we found the grocery store buggy and that was a lifesaver for us. So we started putting the papers in the grocery store buggy and pushing the buggy down the street, throwing the paper to the left, to the right. And it, the route got a lot easier then. 
And that was, uh, that was this white guy on the route that was so interesting to me. This man, he just always, we thought he was a real nice guy because every time we would come by, he would give us like a nickel, he would give us a dime and stuff. Back then, that was a whole lot of money. Yeah, yeah. A nickel and a dime was a lot of money back then in the early 70s. So when it was time to collect, this nice guy who we thought was a nice guy by giving us money every now and then, when we go to collect for the newspaper, it, at the age of 11, I'm a collector now. I, not only do I throw the paper, but I have to actually collect the money from people. Who will trust a 11 year old person to collect money from adults? <laughs> but anyway, so now I have to go and collect the money. I would knock on this door and collect the money. And when I tell him how much he owes, he's like, no, I gave you a nickel on Tuesday. I gave you a dime Thursday, so I only owe. <laughs> And we thought he was just tipping us or just being nice. We didn't know he was paying for his paper back then. So, <laughs> you know, you learn a lot when you get on a job. You know, they don't tell you everything yeah. in new member orientation or new uh, employee orientation. They don't tell you all the stuff that's going to happen. So, you know, a lot of stuff you learn on the job. Uh -huh. And I didn't know much about throwing papers. It looked easy, you know, just throw the paper on there and then people know how much they owe and you got how much they owe, just go ahead and get it and turn it in. But it was interesting, that whole process. So I started thinking about that. The next job after that I had was, uh, I think I was probably around 14. That's when I started working for the, um, it's called the EOA back then, Employment Opportunity Something, whatever the EOA stood for. But it was for poor kids to make summer jobs, to have summer jobs. So we have our own money and things like that. So I work for them as a youth counselor and all this stuff. I'm not gonna tell you my work history, but just to let you know what it feels like when you get a job and that job is paying you some money. Mm -hmm. We all have been there before. We all know the feeling of what it's like. We also know what it's like to want the job. And you know, I've learned something also. When I applied for a job and I hadn't heard back from that job yet, you know, I was taught just like you all, send a thank you note follow up, you know, go back. We heard Pastor West's story about how he had to go every day. Every day he had to go until finally one day he went there and nobody showed up and he got the job. So we all have our stories <laughs> yeah. of how we get jobs. But what I learned is I don't want to hear from a job that I applied with nothing in the mail. Uh -huh. Usually when they send you a letter, that means you're not hired. Not too many people got a letter that stated they were hired. Usually, if they were hire you, they would call you. They would tell you on the phone that you got hired, and then they'll let you know that you would get a follow-up letter of uh, what to do after that. But usually, if you got a letter from somebody you applied for, that was a good chance you wouldn't get in that job. So, let's transition. Going past all opportunities of trying to find a job and get a job and see how all that time to this text that I read this morning and how we got hired. Do you know when you decided to commit to Jesus mm -hmm. and you gave Jesus your heart and you gave the pastor your hand, do you know that you just agreed to an employment contract? <laughs> yep. Yep. My mind. You agreed to become a disciple for Jesus and your job was a disciple. Mm -hmm. How many of you know that disciples are not made. I mean, disciples are not born. Mm -hmm. They are made. That's it. That's it. Yes. Uh -huh. We're not born disciples. We are made disciples. Jesus said, go and make disciples. Mm -hmm. We weren't born that. If you are born with something or born into something, the element of choice has been taken away. All right. For example, when we were born, we weren't given a choice as to the type of family that we would be born into. Nope. I had no say so in it. God didn't ask me who I wanted to go to, what city I wanted to live in, what state I wanted. God didn't ask me nothing. <laughs> I didn't have a choice. Yeah, yeah. You didn't have a choice. We had no say so into where and who we were born into. We had no say so about our genetic makeup. We had no idea that because our dad and our mommy looked like that, we gonna look like that. <laughs> we weren't given a choice about our physical features. I couldn't tell God I wanted to be tall. He didn't ask me if I wanted to be tall or not. 
God didn't ask us any of these things that, you know, why God didn't ask me if I wanted to be born into a family with a lot of money? <laughs> I would say it quite naturally, sure. <laughs> we, we didn't have a choice of what nation that we'd be born into to become a citizen of. We didn't have a choice of what neighborhood we were born in. We didn't have a choice. We weren't born. So we didn't have a choice into what we were born yeah, into. That's it. That's mm -hmm. it. But being a disciple, on the other hand, is by choice. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yes, yes. We get to choose to be a disciple, or we choose not to be a disciple. Mm. When Jesus saw Peter and Andrew fishing and said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men, they on their own free will immediately left everything they were doing and followed Jesus. Yeah. Jesus didn't force them. <laughs> he didn't twist their hand behind their back. He didn't bait and hook them or hook and bait them or whatever the phrase is. <laughs> he just said, follow me. And I will make you fishers of men. Yeah. Uh huh. Yes. Now that whole phrase kind of puzzled me for quite a while, because when I'm out fishing, I know I can sell fish and get money, mm -hmm. or I can get the fish and cook it and eat it and feed my family. Yeah. Uh huh. What am I gonna do with the men? Yeah. That I catch. <laughs> What am I say? Why would I? Why would I jump at the opportunity to not get this fish that makes me money and feed my family, and go and follow Jesus and become a fisherman of men? Uh huh. What are the benefits of fishing for men? All right. The same applied to all the other men that made up Jesus' first twelve disciples. Mm -hmm. Well, he said, "Come, follow me." Even Judas made a decision to follow Jesus. Yeah. He wasn't forced to become a disciple. He decided at the request and invitation of Jesus to follow him. Yes. The choice to be a disciple of Jesus isn't a decision that is taken blindly or half-heartedly. We must fully be aware of what it entails to be a disciple. We must know what we are getting into and we must make the decision by counting the cost of what it takes to be a disciple. Yeah. Yes. And we find out what it costs when we read the gospel according to Luke in that 14th chapter. Discipleship is a choice to make Jesus your number one priority in uh -huh. life. Yes. It's a choice. I stated to you earlier, I was doing a lot of thinking on how to bless God with what God would give me to share with you. And I realized as your friend, as your family member, as your pastor, as a one who loves the Lord and love doing what the Lord has commanded and demanded for my life, mm -hmm. I would be remiss if I didn't put emphasis on what it means for those of us in the body to be disciples and therefore to go and make disciples. Yeah, yes. yeah. Amen. It's a choice to make Jesus your number one priority in life. Oh, yes. Yes, yes. This choice is a decision to place Jesus above everything else and everyone and everybody else in your life. Yes. And if other things and people including our families, our businesses, our pleasures, desires, and personal ambitions, if we make those more important to us than Jesus, then we can't be said to be said that we are disciples of Jesus. All right, make it plain now. Yeah. If we treat lightly our time with God, if we treat lightly doing the work but give more importance to parties, to our jobs, mm. to hanging out, to brunches, yeah, yeah. dinners, hobbies, and all those things. If we make them and the time doing them more important and more valuable than the time we spend with God, we have to question our God 
as a disciple. Come on, come on. Thank you. Really, we're not ready yet to be disciples if we can't make those things not the priority of our life and make Jesus the priority. Uh -huh. yes. And this don't mean that God don't want us to love and care for our families. It don't mean that God don't want us to love and care for businesses and careers and other responsibilities. Mm -hmm. But what God wants from us as disciples, uh, he wants his followers to make being with Jesus the most important thing, living with Jesus the most important thing, and working for Jesus the most important things in our life. Yeah. 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 He didn't say we couldn't do those others. Yeah, yeah. He didn't even say we couldn't enjoy them. Mm -hmm. Just don't make them the main things. All That's right. It. That's it. Come on. <laughs> Luke in 14 and 33 says, simply put, if you are not willing to take what is dearest to you, whether plans or people, and kiss it goodbye, you can't be my disciples. Come That's on. It. That's Amen. what Jesus was saying when he said, those who put their hands to the plow and turn back are not fit for the kingdom. All right. Because discipleship is a choice we make saying it and meaning it that we are ready to suffer for Christ and the gospel because this verse tells us that as a disciple, we must be ready to bear our own cross. Yes, yeah. Take up our own cross and come after Jesus. Yes. It means we are ready to face and endure whatever comes our way as we follow Jesus. Oh, yes. yes. This cross, this cross where Jesus shed his blood that gave us victory, mm -hmm. this is the place where we triumph over sin. Mm -hmm. The same place we triumph over sickness and yes. other problems of our life. Yes. yes. Over the principalities and the powers of darkness. <laughs> we triumph over the enemies that bring our way and destructions to our way. We triumph at this cross because this cross is symbolic of the pain, the suffering, the trials, the afflictions, the persecutions, and the hardship that comes with walking with the Lord and working for the Lord. Mm. You're preaching now. If there is a cross for the disciples to carry, it means there is pain, mm. there is suffering, mm -hmm. uh -huh. there are trials, there are hardships to face, there are, there are stuff we have to endure, and there are things that we have to overcome. Yes. yes. Next, we make disciples. We don't mass produce disciples. <laughs> we make disciples. We don't mass produce them. Producing something in large quantities automatically and very quickly is not how we make disciples. It's not how come disciples on, are on. made. Mm -hmm. uh, Help us. When we go to factories, uh, manufacturing companies, we will see how they turn out thousands and thousands of items and projects and widgets and all those things you learn about. Let me see how it worked. When I was in the 11th grade, I had the unique opportunity to go to the General Motors plant in Lakewood, in the Lakewood area of Atlanta, as a high school junior to work there for one day on the assembly line and actually be a part of putting together a car that somebody drove once it came off the assembly line. Mm. All right. In that General Motors warehouse, we all were assigned different spots along the assembly line. And they said they would turn off a car back then. It was like every 72 minutes, they would turn off a brand new car. Mm. Now, that's fast to produce something that is so important in our society. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Something that can get you from point A to point B. Something that could be the cause of taking someone's life and injuring them because of an accident. Something that, if not put together properly, properly could be dangerous. Mm -hmm. But they churn them things out just like that. They produce the cars so fast. Now, I don't even know how fast they produce the cars, but this was back in the 70s when it took 72 minutes to make a General Motors car. Mm -hmm. 
you have seen if you had the unique privilege of going to the Krispy Kreme over on Lee, off Lee Street uh -huh. when they got the hot donuts now sign up <laughs> and you see the old donuts on that conveyor machine and they dropping that icing on it and how it looks so good how you not only buy one dozen but you say give me another dozen because you've seen how good those donuts look coming off that machine that's what you remember wouldn't it be nice if that's how we made disciples? <laughs> we were able to just put them through the conveyor belt and they just come up and you see that good Jesus oil, the Holy Spirit oil just coming down on them. And they just as, and we're just as good at this Krispy Kreme donut hot now sign is. Yes. Unfortunately, we can't mass produce yeah. disciples. Yeah. No, we can't. Jesus was very intentional in the choice of words he used when he gave us this great commission. Oh, yes. Jesus deliberately used the word, make disciples. Yes. And Jesus could have chose any of bajillions of words that he knew. Jesus could have created a word for what he wanted us to do. Yes. Yes. But he intentionally chose the word make, make disciples. Mm. Yes. That's it. That's it. And I believe Jesus chose the word make disciples because making something involves preparation and it involves process. Oh, yes. It involves preparation and it involves process. Do you know the reason we eat out so much in America is because we don't want to have to prepare the meal and we don't want to have to go through the process of making it. Mm. That's, yeah. it. That's it. That's why we would rather pick up our phone and Uber Eats, Grubhub it. We don't even want to go out and get it anymore. Come on now. Come on now. We would rather just go to the computer and type in a and some of us have orders already in there. We have regular orders. We just go in and click again, and it just come to us. Yes. Have the tip already included, have everything, and we don't even have to see it. They just come and leave it on our porch and run, and there it is. No preparation involved, no planning, no process. What do you want to eat? I want pizza. Okay, let's go and order something. And there it is, 30 minutes later on our porch. Come on. Wouldn't it be nice if we could do that for disciples? Yeah. Yes. We could just get online on Zoom and send out an email to 100 people and now they're disciples. Yeah. But when you have to cook a meal, mm -hmm. you have to prepare, you have to plan. First, you have to go to the market. First, you have to have money. You have to have a job to make money to go to the market. That's it. And then you have to find the finest of choice cuts for the meat. Yeah. Yeah. You have to find the freshest of greens from old man Johnson's farm. <laughs> and then you have to go home, you have to wash the greens. You have to some of y'all soak the greens in the sink. Yeah. And then you have to shuck them and get all the stuff out of it. And you have to cut them up and do all that stuff to it. And you know, I'm just talking about what I've seen and I've never done that before in my life, but I know the process and I know what yeah. it's like. Yeah. Now, some of y'all know this stuff, and y'all do it so well. But y'all know what's good greens when you see it. Is y'all can go and just look at a bunch, and yeah, oh, don't, yeah. don't, they ain't no good right now. Go, go over here and get that bunch right there. Look, baby, go and give me that one right now. That one, that one, that one come from Mr. Taylor's farm. Go and give me that bunch of greens right there. He always have good greens. Some of y'all are just so gifted at knowing good food when you see it. And some of y'all know good people who have good meats. Y'all know which farms has the best peas. Y'all know which farms have the best cow. Y'all know something like that. Y'all know which store sells the best meats, which store sells the best produce, which store has the best prices. We know stuff like that. So we yeah. plan to go to those stores and there's a process we have. So this is what we're gonna do. I'm gonna go and get this and I want you to stand in line so by the time I finish, we'll be at the front of, you know, we know, the, we know this yeah, stuff. Yeah. The same thing happened in making disciples. Yeah. When Jesus called his disciples, he spent time teaching them, explaining parables to them, giving them insights into the mysteries of the kingdom. Mm. Yes, yes. I remember 
watching my great grandmama sit down in her chair with a big old pot while she would shuck beans and peas and greens and corn and how she would prepare what to me was probably the best meals ever because it's something about when you're a kid the older people's food it seemed like tastes better than your mother's food for some reason. <laughs> it was something about grandmama's cooking that was better than mama's cooking. And I don't know what it was. Maybe grandmama had burned up so much when she was younger she had figured it out by the time she got older. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. don't you know the same process happened in discipleship? Mm. When I was younger, I didn't know how to disciple as well as I do now. Come yeah, on. yeah. And some of y'all are the same way. You might not have knew as much back then as you mm -hmm. do now. Yes. When I cook something, I have to ask Tisa and or go to YouTube to figure out how to do it. And I'm going mm -hmm. step by step mm -hmm. off the instructions. Uh-huh. Now, if I were to call one of you all and ask you all how to cook something, Y'all tell me, get a pinch of salt and a pinch of this. Y'all don't, don't need no teaspoons and measurements yeah, yeah. and all that stuff. Y'all know it from the heart and the head. Y'all yeah. can just go and look in the cabinet and just pull stuff and get stuff and grab this and grab this. And next thing you know, you have a five-course meal that tastes so good that make you want seconds. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Jesus he made disciples by spending time with them and he watched them closely. You know, one of the best young cooks I know is Chessa. Mm -hmm. And I hear the stories of how she spent a lot of time around her mom and how she spent a lot of time around Nana learning how to cook. Yeah. Uh -huh. And it's amazing when you see a young person who knows how to cook very well but the reason they know how, not that they wanted to cook good, but they spent a lot of time around somebody who knew how to cook good. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's it. And that person spent a lot of time training and teaching them how to cook, letting them yeah. lick the cake spoon, letting them have their own little pot to shuck greens and peas and stuff with, while they being a miniature adult. That's what Jesus was doing when he was teaching them when he's explaining yeah, yeah. them to them in parables and all these other things, he made them watch him closely as he taught and observed them in their life. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's good. Jesus taught them about things, and as he taught them, they began to observe things that Jesus did that they didn't quite understand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's why it finally got to them when they said, Jesus, teach us how to pray uh -huh. because they realized that it was something powerful when Jesus prayed when he came back. Yes. that's it that's it and they saw that power and they wanted that power yes. how oh, yeah. is it that he's able to do this and once they came to the conclusion it was because of him praying they said teach us how to do it how to do it that's it oh yeah come on god the personal experiences they had in their walk with God made up the process. The personal experiences that you have with God makes up your process. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. The experience you have with Jesus on a boat, they were caught in a boisterous storm. Mm -hmm. That added to their process, to their hands-on learning experience to learn how to trust, to the training video that Jesus was sharing and showing them. They had experiences with Jesus that taught them that you could be a disciple of Christ. Yeah. You could be in close proximity of Jesus in the boat with you and the storms of life will still beat up against your house. That's yes, it. it That's it. Even with Jesus in your house sleeping. Mm. Yeah, yeah. They also learned that when Jesus is with you in the boat of your life through the storms, through the storm. even though it might toss and turn, it will not sink or drown when the storms and life of trials come because you of your relationship with Jesus. That's it. Yes. Thank you, guys. Peter knew that. Peter knew what it felt like to have some faith so strong that you can step out and walk on water and do extraordinary stuff because of Jesus. And at the same time, Peter knew the low of what it is to deny Jesus 
and feel the pain and agony of his own betrayal to Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yes. The disciples experience what it's like to be timid and fearful believers who deny Jesus because of fear of persecution. Yes. Some, if you're honest, are guilty of that as well. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't be caught praying at work. You wouldn't be caught reading a text of scripture around certain people. Mm -hmm. Not saying that you are fearful of persecution, but maybe you're thinking this is not the time or place to say anything yeah. good about the Lord. This is not the time or place to let nobody know about my relationship with Jesus. You know, it don't take all that. You know, my relationship with Jesus is private. You know, don't nobody need to know that. This is how we deny, and this is how we become timid and fearful when we're not bold enough to let people know about that. I wish I would be somewhere and I'm talking to them and my wife walk up and I don't introduce my wife. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wish I would. And don't let it be some other lady who might be attractive. Uh, and I'm talking to her smiling and my wife walk up. And who is this? She don't want to know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The same way when you walk up with the spirit of the Lord around you, people want to know, what is it? What is it? People want to know. Amen. They became bold and fervent disciples who were ready and willing to stand and speak out for Jesus before anyone's opinion of them because of their position in life in yeah, Christ. Yeah. Yes. They learned, they grew, they developed, they got stronger, they matured spiritually through the personal experience they had, through the trials they went through and they didn't become disciples overnight. They weren't yeah. automatically disciples. They went through a process. process. <laughs> they were made yeah. disciples. Yes. Mm -hmm. Jesus didn't turn out disciples. You know, and that's what's so interesting. Because we already know and understand the process, especially if you ever join in an organization that had what they call a probationary period. That's when I chose that you're hired. Yeah, yeah. Even though you are hired, mm -hmm. you still have to go through new member orientation or some type of training before they just let you go on the floor or in the room or in the office or wherever you are working. Mm -hmm. You have to go through a training. I remember when I first started with Revenue, after the orientation, I was told this is the busy time of year. So what we want you to do they bought this big old, the book's about this thick. I promise you, about this thick. It was the Revenue Agent Manual. Yep, yep. And they said, we just want you to read this while we work, because we ain't got time to train you right now. And unfortunately, there are churches, and there are people in the church, that's how you train people to be disciples. You just give them this big old Bible and say, go and read this. I'm too busy to yeah, disciple you. Yeah, Help us. All right. Help that's us. it. They come to you, and they have a question. Oh, just read the Bible. Yeah, yeah. Do you know that Revenue Agent Manual, that's how I started drinking coffee. Did I ever tell y'all how I started drinking coffee? <laughs> that's how I started drinking coffee. <laughs> Reading that big old thick Revenue Agent Manual. Do you know, I wish somebody would have told me a long time ago when you first became a Christian, start drinking coffee. <laughs> because that Bible is the same way. Yeah, uh -huh. When someone yeah. tells you to read the Bible, I can sleep with reading the Bible. That's the reason I wake up in the morning and I make me a cup of coffee early. So when uh -huh. I start my devotion, even though I just had a good night of sleep, yeah. if I don't drink that coffee, as much as I love the word of God, I'm yeah. a, whoo. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> whoo. And I be hoping somebody texts me or uh, email or go off on the phone ring and say, whoo, yeah. let me start doing this now. Because yeah. it's heavy. Yeah. It's not easy. And when you are learning, do you know that learning is equivalent to lifting weights? Mm. When you are reading something and learning something you don't know, your brain works just as hard as your biceps do when you're lifting weights. That's it. It sure does. We have to realize the preparation and the process can't be done quickly nor automatically. I wish I can go to the gym today and then have a six pack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wish I could just take a pill and lose 20 pounds. 
<laughs> instantly. Uh -huh. I, as a matter of fact, no, I take that back. I wish I could just eat the food I like, like donuts and cookies and stuff, and never gain yeah. weight and look good all the time. Yeah. That's what I really wish. Oh, yeah, come on. Now we're talking. <laughs> that just don't happen. That's just not the process. That's not the process. Because this process of discipleship places a high demand on our time. Yes. Yes. We are told that Jesus appointed his disciples to be with him, that he might send them out. They were chosen to be with him so he could send them out to be a blessing. So he could pour their life into, to pour his life into them so they could pour that same life into other people. Come on. That's it. Abiding in Christ, abiding in his word, takes time. Yes. I can't rush through reading the Bible every morning. I have, it takes so much time because I don't read as fast as some of you all. I can't pronounce all the words like as good as some of you all. So I have to take my time. Sometimes I have to go and find out what this word means. Yeah. Sometimes I have to just stop and scratch my head like, did that say that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It takes time. And even when I hear some of you all share the word, even when I hear people preach, even when I hear people communicate the goodness of the Lord, I still have to take time to observe it. You mean you did this and you went through that? And not have a scratch on your body? Uh-huh. What is that? You know, that don't make sense to me. I, I need to kind of comprehend that. So, yeah, yeah. you got T-boned by 18 wheeler, and you got up and walked and not a scratch on your body. Mm. Yeah, yeah. See, it takes time to disciple. Yeah. Because, see, if that happened to you, that lets me know that that can happen to me. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. Going through the process going through personal experiences of other disciples where we have failed several times in our life and we got back up again but we failed several times in our life and we got back up again but we yeah. failed several times in our life and got back up again and uh -huh. shared if it had not been for the Lord on my yeah. side oh, yeah. I don't know Thank where you know. I would have done or where I would have been yes it takes time to develop faith. Yes. Yes. Because no matter what you do and no matter how faithful you were after you did it, doubt is right around the corner ready to test you again. <laughs> yes, it is. Discipleship don't happen quickly in a factory or a manufacturing room. It happens in a living room in a one-on-one -on -one conversation. It happened in yes. a break room drinking some water or eating lunch. It happens outside in the driveway talking to your neighbor. It happened in the checkout line at the public or the Kroger grocery store while you're getting ready to check out. It don't happen mass production related. All right, come on. But what we have to do today, we who want to be disciples, we who, who want to make disciples, we can't skip the preparation nor the process. Amen. We have to. We have to be the kind of believers Jesus spoke about in Matthew 13, 20 through 21. Because some believers fall away and turn away from God when trials and persecutions come. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've heard some friends of mine say, I'm going to get back in church, but right now I'm going through something. Mm -hmm. And I just can't for the life of me believe how you choose to stay away from those who have gone through stuff and overcome them by the word of God. How you choose to stay away from them because you're going through something and you share it with people who can't help you. All yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Jesus explained that the root reason for this is they have no root. That's it. That's All it. right. They didn't spend enough time in it. They didn't put water on it. They didn't put fertilizer on it. They didn't. You know, it reminds me of that maple, say that Japanese maple that we tried to grow out in our front yard, that the deer kept coming out eating off of, that we never got enough rain for, that we didn't put in the best of soil, we didn't put enough nurture, nutrients around it, and eventually we had to pluck it up because it never grew right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That happens to too many of people who attempts to become a disciple. Yeah. That's it. Didn't spend enough time in it. 
they haven't understood uh understood the process of what it takes to truly be a disciple mm -hmm. and because of that when the storms of life came when the rains came it blew them away amen so now because people don't want to spend enough time because people are not getting rooted properly mm -hmm. we have what's called microwave christians mm. Oh, microwave Christians because believers who want a shortcut approach to discipleships they have now become microwave Christians all right they want all the benefits <laughs> come on they want all the blessings that come yeah, with being yeah. a disciple but they don't want to spend time knowing Jesus Jesus all right they don't want to spend time growing their faith they don't want to spend time growing in the knowledge and growing in the grace of God. Thank you. But they can tell you how to take the engine out of the car. Yeah, yeah. They can tell you how to grow watermelons in a, in a drought. Mm -hmm. They can tell you how to bring animals together and make the best animals to have the biggest and the best tasting meats. But they don't have time to spend to become a disciple of Jesus. They don't want to go through preparation they don't want to go through process. And what this does is produces weak Christians. Mm. Mm. Christians who faint, who give up, who turn away from God in the days of adversities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Discipleship is putting down the walls of racism, putting down the walls of classism, prejudice, discriminations, because Jesus said, make disciples of all nations and what he meant by that is take the gospel to everybody, everybody. that's it everybody. I don't care about their social status I don't care about what tribe they from their background, their character their sexuality, their gender no one is excluded from the gospel of Jesus Christ L1 it's inclusive, the gospel of Jesus Christ is the original rainbow yes it is <laughs> It's time for us as disciples to take it back. Take back the rainbow. Come yeah, on. Yeah. Take it back from those who have it now and give it back to its rightful owner, the disciples of Christ. The old as well as the young, this gospel is available to everybody. Thank you, Jesus. We have to understand that we have to be proactive in sharing this message of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yes. We see that there's no such thing as Jew or Greek when it comes to the gospel. No such thing as free or slave, yes. male or female, because the world as we know it all belongs to the Lord. Yes, it is. Discipleship. Thank you, God. The master is the teacher and the discipler is the student. And we have to realize our place when we are learning what it means to be a disciple but Jesus. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Isn't it amazing how it makes it hard to preach and reach out to all nations when we have these biases? Help us, God. Yeah. Yes. There are certain people that I had to really ask myself about myself when it comes to how is it that I can let the sound of someone's voice keep me from wanting to hear the word of God from that person. Mm. Yeah, yeah. How is it can I hear, so how is it can I look at a person and because that person don't look the way I want them to look, I can tune them out when they're trying to share a message from the Lord to me. Jesus. Mm. I want the Lord to help us who are believers. I want the Lord to help us who are disciples to live outside the walls of racism, classism, favoritism, prejudice, and discrimination. And when we see people, I want us to see Jesus. I want us to see people free from sin, free from discrimination, free from all those things that turns us away from yes. being disciples and making disciples. Yes. Yes. Because we have tools to help us. We have tools to help us train and develop disciples. Jesus oh, said, yes. teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded. Do you know if we spent just a little bit 
just a wee bit mm-hmm. more time sharing what, te- what Jesus commanded versus sharing what I heard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why is it that when people come up to you, they say, come here, let me tell you what I heard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and why is it not what Jesus commanded? My God. I heard, I heard she left him. Mm-hmm. No, child. <laughs> what? <laughs> and they say, you know, hold on. Whatever we do, we put it down. Pull up a chair. What happened? That's how we are when we see people. And they say, come here, let me tell you what I heard. You ain't going to believe this. Mm-hmm. Wouldn't it be amazing if we had the same type of energy when it comes to, come here, let me tell you what the Lord did. I ain't got time for all that. I ain't got time. You know, uh, I, I go to church. I go to church every Sunday. I, I, my pastor preach every Sunday. I ain't got time for all that. Uh, it's particularly important that we teach the whole gospel of Jesus. That's it. That's you, it. You know, I shared with y'all before my disdain of what's called the prosperity gospel. And not that I don't have, not that I have a problem with the prosperity gospel. I have a problem with people thinking that that's the only gospel. Yeah, yeah. I don't have a problem with the social uh, justice movement. I have a problem with people thinking that that's the only movement. Yeah, yeah. I don't have a problem with people who just want to come and praise and worship, tear the church up, and go home and be a sinner. Mm-hmm. I don't have a problem with people tearing the church up in a spirit filled. Holy Ghost driven worship experience. My problem is if you think that's the only thing to do. Yeah. Come on. Come on. Because see, the gospel is whole. And what yeah. Jesus commanded his disciples to do was the whole gospel that he yes. taught them and commanded uh-huh. them to do. Yes. That's why it's so important to me that we realize that when we accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we had committed. That we were going to be at work from Monday through Friday, 8 to 5.30, with a 30-minute lunch break and two 15-minute breaks. Mm-hmm. And the rest of that time, we're going to be working, doing yeah. what we're supposed to do to get that paycheck every 15th and end of the month. That's it. When you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you committed to that local church, you basically agreed to do the same thing. Yeah, yeah. That you study your Bible consistently every day. You will pray consistently every day. You will teach people what the Lord has done for you every day based off of what you learned from somebody who taught you what the Lord did for them. Come on. Yes. That's what you just got hired for. Congratulations. You're hired.